Podcast Talk by Gamma, keeping you connected and protected. Welcome to DAS Talk, the essential podcast on distributed antenna systems and in building communication. Hosted by Peter, VP of Gamma, and Philip Nicholas. This Gamma Electronic Series focuses on emergency response and safety. Join us as we navigate the challenges of building effective communication systems for North America's first responders. We delve into the advancements in emergency responder radio systems and the transformative impact on new technologies. Tune in for insightful discussions aimed at increasing knowledge and awareness in the DAS field. Whether you are a professional or an enthusiast, DAS Talk is your gateway to understanding the nexus of technology, safety, and communication. Hey everyone, welcome to today's episode of DAS Talk. I am super excited to be with you today. As always, we have a very fun and very exciting episode to dive into today. We have our special guest, Hollis Heron. She will go ahead and introduce herself in just a second. We also have Gil Martinez from Gamma and myself, Peter, VP of Gamma. We are one happy family today, all together talking about some of our passionate, passionate things like DAS and code and all sorts of cool stuff today. So I can't wait to get into it. Hollis, go ahead and please introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, thanks, Peter. I'm happy to be here today. Um, my name's Hollis Heron, as you said. Uh, I am a registered professional electrical engineer. Uh, I'm located here in Seattle, Washington, and I've been working in the building construction industry as a consulting engineer um, and a systems integrator for over 30 years. Um, I did uh, work for nine years in systems integration in the DAS space, which uh, I really felt was a valuable experience in terms of um, not just designing systems, but, but actually uh, getting them commissioned and, and performing correctly per, you know, the code or the, um, the authority having jurisdiction standards. Um, I'm now back in consulting. And um, we're just happy to share my knowledge and some anecdotal sort of stories about what, it, what it's been like, challenges, successes, things like that. Awesome. I noticed uh, you have a wall of, of fame behind you that kind of talks a little bit about some of your very cool accomplishments that you've, you've done. I see some degrees and some other things like that, maybe some professional certifications. Why, go ahead and tell us about those, those, some of those certifications you got yeah, back there. Yeah, well, the stuff that's on my wall, uh, mostly I've framed the licenses for the states that I'm licensed in, which include Washington, Oregon, Idaho, California, Colorado. And then I'm also have a, I'm also a lead certified or accredited professional. So, and then I'm a graduate from the University of Washington, 1989. So those are, those are the things that are behind me to remind me that I, I used to be a contender. <laughs> All the exams that I've taken, how's that? Yeah, I, I bet you still are, because I remember recently we just attended uh, a seminar, and in the seminar, uh, that's where I actually heard about you the first time, and it was uh, an in-building seminar, and there were several questions asked at the end, and there was one person there who was answering every single question. And then I asked Gil, who was sitting next to me, I was like, who is that? And he said, oh, that's Hollis. She's an old friend of mine. And I was like, yeah, I'm like, she's just nailing every answer right off the bat. I said, wow, I, I was impressed. So that said, um, I, I know you've got a lot going on. Let's dive into some of these some of these kind of fun topics that we wanted to hit. So let's talk about code, man. I mean, code is, code is a big part of DAS. It's a big part of Ursi's. It's a big part of everything that we do, we kind of navigate through it. It can be really, really difficult for some people to kind of get a grip around. Some people don't even know what codes are involved, what standards. So give us like a little, little starting point about where this, where these codes came from. I know I've talked to you before a little bit about, well, there was some code mentioned. It mentioned in building, I think it was the NFPA 72 standard you mentioned, but it wasn't very good. So what, what's happened in the beginning. You're right. So I can take you all in, and our audience to the Wayback Machine. <laughs> and it's one of the benefits of being, you know, kind of senior in my career. I mean, I'm sure, you know, everyone historically, they weren't alive, know about, you know, the tragedy of 
and the uh, communication problems that occurred with the Twin Towers, um, where the firefighters raced into the buildings but were unable to talk with each other and coordinate their efforts or even talk to command. And so that, of course, resulted in 3,000, you know, deaths. And so the code, the governing code body started looking at in-building communications for firefighters um, back then, and it took several code cycles, I'm going to say, for any mention of um, emergency responder communication enhancement systems to occur in a document. And so it first showed up in um, NFPA 72, the 2009 edition. NFPA 72 is the National Fire Alarm and Signaling Code. So it, at least it was stated somewhere um, as with a, a sort of performance requirements for construction. There was no supporting actual code like the International Fire Code that stated when and where you needed it. Um, and that didn't, that didn't show up until the International Fire Code and um, the code cycles kind of leapfrog each other. So anyway, that, that 2009 was the first mention, and it really talked more about um, pathway survivability, which was not very clear. Basically, the wording was, if it's used in lieu of a wired communication system, it shall have pathway survivability of level two. And what, what people who are code militants like I am don't understand is that wired communication systems are only required in high-rise buildings. So it didn't have strong teeth to cover all buildings. But fortunately, the documents started to improve with successive releases. Um, I think it was the International Fire Code 2012, um, where Chapter 510, which is the requirement for buildings to have emergency responder radio covered. Now, we have to, it's really important to understand the, the limitation about coverage versus a system. So the code now requires buildings to have coverage. It doesn't mandate a system. So some buildings are, you know, small enough that they get macro penetration into the building through the building materials so that they can organically have coverage. But, you know, there are a lot of building types out there, you know, very massive buildings like high rise buildings in San Francisco or downtown Seattle. That won't be it won't have that covered organically but at least okay so then in 2012 we get a code that says you need coverage um and then in the reference standard sections of that code it starts to point to um the like the nfpa document that tells you how and for two code cycles that was still nfpa 72 and then in 2016 nfpa 1221 was released where they kind of stripped the language out of NFPA 72 and put it in a document that was more applicable to in-building communications. Now, the interesting thing about that is they still really didn't clarify the pathway survivability questions that people had. There was still this language about level two or level one, level one being cable and meta metallic raceway in a fully sprinkled building. And the only clear aspect of that was that the riser had to be level two survivable. And that requirement didn't make sense for all building types because some building types are not two hour you know, fire rated, you know, from the, you know, the floor assemblies and the shaft assemblies. And so when I was in integration, which was about the time this, this code was, you know, migrating a bit or evolving, um, you know, I did have some projects where we have to put coverage in a warehouse that was like remote, you know, so there wasn't a lot of organic coverage, but the warehouse roof was wood. And so the building itself didn't have a two hour fire rating, but we were still like having to two hour fire rate wrap onto it to meet this requirement. So it's been good to see, you know, the, the subsequent migration. One of the things that was put in NFPA 1221, the 2016 edition, was the requirement for component level monitoring. So I'm just going to simplify that and say antenna monitoring. And that was difficult to implement. There's a couple of manufacturers out there that make products that will do that. 
but in general, my experience as an integration integrator is that they tend to be glitchy. One uses a, a you know a, a an RFID tag and an RF signal at 900 megahertz, and it's very susceptible to distance limitations, and also doesn't work well if you use an LMR style cable with a braided jacket. It'll work fine with a corrugated outer conductor on the coax, but not if you try to, you know, save a little money or you don't really need the RF power to your antenna. Well, anyway. If I could, if I could ask you a question a little bit about uh, the two-hour fire-rated part of this, because this is something that's always kind of intrigued me, just mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, do you know about any data that supports? The idea that having a two-hour chase or two-hour fire-rated uh, cable on, let's call it the riser or the backbone, that indicates, well, this is really going to make this system last longer in a fire. Well, the, um, there's a couple of products out there um, that are available as two-hour rated cables. And they are tested to UL2196, uh, which is circuit integrity. So that cable is tested to meet those same fire requirements and heat requirements as other types of circuit integrity cable that are used for like fire alarm, coax versus a, a twisted pair cable. If you read the fine print on the testing data, the attenuation of uh, linear foot in Increases significantly under the duress of, of fire, of heat. But the system will still work. The cable will not fail. But you might go from 2 dB per linear foot at 800 megahertz attenuation on that cable to, a, to 12 or 15 dB, depending on, you know, the, the intensity of the fire. So you will see a degradation in the in the performance of the system for sure, but it will still function. So yes, I have seen that data. Got it. So there's some data supporting that the the system will still, uh, if there's a fire in in the backbone area, I guess I'm um, hitting that two hour fire rated chase or the cable, then uh, then I suppose it would it would still at least function. Uh, on yeah, a bare it should. Level. And you know we have a. We have a lot of conversations in this industry about the antennas and the fact that the antennas don't have any rating. And so that's the first thing that's going to burn up. And that is correct. But in my discussions with plan reviewers, most, my, my tightest relationship is with the, um, the plan reviewer out of the city of San Francisco. And I will withhold his name, but I think we probably all know who he is. Uh, Absolutely. His, uh, his opinion is that... If you lose an antenna in part of the building where the fire is, but you have other antennas on that floor from the same gas chain, you really want to protect that riser because the firefighters or the sprinkler system could activate or the firefighters could arrive in time to address the circumstance or the situation and put the fire out. And so you would still want that backbone not to be affected by the fire unless the whole building is up in smoke, in which case everybody should just leave and, you know, let the building come down. So I, so I think there's some reasonable logic to that, especially when you're talking about a high-rise building, where even in um, the high-rise fire code, if you have a fire on floor 17 and the alarm goes off, they don't typically evacuate the entire building. A voice evacuation uh, messages will send people down you know, or send people up or send people down away from the fire. They don't want six to 10,000 people flooding out to the street because somebody burnt their toast, let's say, or, you know, that kind of thing. So his, his enforcement and interpretation of the intent of the code is tempered with his knowledge of fire alarm code. So, so, so I think it's, I think it's a good, safe and necessary thing for certain building types. Certainly, if you're talking about the, a, a building I call the Woody Walkup, which is a Type 5 over 1, typically a residential project with underground parking, it doesn't make sense for any of the infrastructure in the wood frame to be rated to a two-hour because the building 
isn't rated to that. Getting to code migrations. <laughs> yes. Um, so in the 2019 version of 1221, they started to recognize building, um, you know, building floor construction and shaft construction and did put in a line um, that stated shall be rated to match the building's fire rating. The, the fine point on that is that buildings themselves don't really have fire ratings. It's the elements of the buildings that have fire ratings, exterior walls, floor, the shafts. And so that was greatly clarified in the new document, which is 1225. So anyway, the, the 1225 standard is obviously the most mature in the history of codes for our industry. Yep, you've got it right there. It, it addresses a lot of issues like the, the lack of clarity of pathway survivability is now pretty well addressed um, in, in 1225. It also has greatly expanded performance criteria from the radio transmitter site because one of the other um, the the other results are you know collateral damage of of codes being in its infancy requiring a thing but not being clear about all the requirements of the thing is that there was a lot of um, uh, noise issues associated with people putting in a system but not um, going through proper uh, commissioning and um, communication with the, the managing radio sites. And so that has been greatly improved in the 1225 document, those requirements. So do you think that, um, and maybe, maybe Gil, you, you, you might be able to add on to this too, do you think that most jurisdictions have already adopted 1225 or, or where are we at with which, which um, NFPA they're, they're currently using? Well, that's a, that's a really, really good question. I'm just going to quickly toggle to a file that I have open. That, um, I did recently, I did a, a comparison. I'm not going to show this to you, but it'll help me keep my head straight in terms of the details. So 1225's um, publication date is, is 2022. And the way code cycles work is that the code might actually have the same publication date. But if it's published earlier than the reference standard, I'm going to call NFPA 1225 a reference standard, then that reference standard isn't necessarily stitched into the code that's being enforced. My, my understanding of codes and the publication dates are that, you know, the, the code is the code. And where the code um, conflicts with the reference standard, the code prevails over the reference standard. And where the code is silent, then the reference standard prevails. But the reference standard has to be part of the adopted code. And so if a reference standard gets published later than the publication of the date of, of the code, and the code is adopted by a state, let's say, then it is not part of that adoption unless it is amended into it. So I'm trying, I promise I'm going to answer your question. So I have a project in the state of California right now where we are under California building code that predates 1225. And the AHJ certainly has an option to decide they want to, they want to go with a more stringent or more current code. Um, but they're not going to. And so this reference standard, the 1225 for this particular project, doesn't apply, which is unfortunate because its pathway survivability criteria is much clearer and would be to the benefit of my project. But because the, the building code has different changes that they don't want to address, it's like they want me to stick with this older reference standard. So that happens, and it's just really uh, it's really incumbent upon that the consultant or integrators, a lot of integrators do design to really uh, know what code cycle they're under because they may still need to do things that are required in the 2016 version of NFPA 1221, like this antenna monitoring, because the jurisdiction has not adopted the latest standards. So you have to do your research with every project every time. Wow, that's a 
that's a lot of work. Um, I guess, I mean, in general, just to kind of navigate through that and figure that out, you got to make sure you're communicating very well with the jurisdiction to find out what code cycle they're using. Otherwise, right. you could design a system and even perhaps build a system that uh, isn't code compliant and uh, or, or like you're saying, it could cost you more. You mentioned that using the NFPA uh, reference because they're not, how is that going to benefit your project you're talking about right there by, by using the newer code? Well, if I were using the newer code, then I wouldn't need to do two-hour rated pathway on my riser because my buildings are not high rises and they are fully sprinkled. So that's one of the one of the language or pieces of the language that's been clarified in 1225 is that if your building is fully sprinkled per I think it's an FPA 13 and it's not a high rise, then you know you pathway survivability can match the 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 um, elements of the building. And so um, that would help. Now, on the flip side, my my project's in a VHF territory where the firefighters' frequencies are VHF, so I don't need full coverage in those buildings anyway. And so I'm not really looking at a bunch of, you know, a full building full of two-hour rated shafts. So, um, so it's sort of a trade-off for mine. If I needed to do full coverage in all these buildings, I would really be pushing to not go to the 1225 standard for my for my project. So now the other thing that people may or may not realize about the code is that it does require, this is going back to your question, Peter, about how do people keep track of this? Both the code and the reference standards require the AHJ to publish a document that and make it available that clarifies their requirements. So they, they're, they are obligated by the code to say what, what they're enforcing, how they're enforcing it, what they expect for plan submissions, what the frequencies are that they, they require on the system, you know, isolation values, uplink, you know, maximum, minimum uplink signals are required to publish all of them. And some jurisdictions do and some don't. And I think if they don't, they just don't know about it. Like the city of San Francisco has re been re publishing a requirements document for probably 10 years. So they've known about it. And then I would say the fledgling Bay Area cities and counties around San Francisco also do that. And I know here in, um, I'm in Seattle, our peace and coordinator does a really good job of making those, those documents public, you know, publicized and accessible. But not all jurisdictions do, and uh, that can be quite challenging. It can be really challenging to try to find the document online, try to find it on a county or city's web page, try to find the right person to call if you can't find this document, and then, of course, have that gentle conversation with them of, you're supposed to publish it. <laughs> Where is it? This is, this is the code that's been adopted by your state and therefore adopted by your county and adopted by your city. And it says you're supposed to do this thing. So can we do that? Can you provide me with that? So and they're like, yeah, I'll find it somewhere here. And, and then two weeks later, you're like, oh, I still don't have it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have, I've had projects where I have submitted an email and I've watched it get forwarded. I'll get copied on it. Oh, can't answer that. So-and-so can answer that. And, da -da -da -da. and then nothing, you know, and two months later, I have to say, Hey, I'm just wondering, <laughs> this is getting critical. Well, I remember I too, really Hollis, no. uh, I was going to say, I remember too, like calling, um, you know, HJs or, or fire departments or whatever it might be like in California where they were VHF. So obviously you're, you're concerned what the frequencies are and all that. So I would talk to maybe as a fire marshal or whoever, and they would tell me, well, I can't release that information to you. And I'm like, it's, it's public knowledge. It's, you know, you can uh -huh. get it from the FCC. I just want to make sure we have exactly what you all are using. Right. Um, but it's one of those things where, yeah, they were just very concerned, you know, from a public safety perspective of not disclosing that information. Right. Um, but it's like, we need that information. And I was doing it on behalf of an integrator. But it's like, yeah, we need that information to design and build the systems that are going to work for your, uh, you know, for EMS, for police, for the, for their, you know, fire folks. 
but it's it's to your point like where is that information how do you get it so I mean, right. it's not like you're it's not like you're asking for their server password or something like that yeah no uh, no, you, no you're, you are quite literally asking for information that it is on the fcc site you can look at you can look all this stuff up but but gill's point is right on the money it's like they may they may have licensed eight interwoven VHF pairs, but they may for <laughs> your for the region of your project only needs three, and those three pairs are aren't interwoven. That's a different cost and a different DAS, you know. And so if you know you only have to do command one, two, and three, and they're nice frequency pairs, and you can do a duplex DAS, woohoo! But if they need you to do all eight and four of the pairs are interwoven, then suddenly you're into extensive filtration or simplex, you know, or something like that. It's a cost difference. So, you know, they they really they really need to tell us what you know, what they want. Tell us what you want. Yeah. And, you know, publish your document. It's almost like one being want... in a... Sorry, Gil, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's okay. No, no. One thing I want to ask you, Hollis, because I know we had met when we both worked for Integrator. Like most of my professional career was an Integrator, which I feel um, was just invaluable because you know what it's like to be installing these systems, designing them, you know, fighting for wall space, all those different things. But one thing I know, um, like in 1225, is that you can, in theory, commingle systems. And I remember as an Integrator, you know, it could be a you know, a hospital, it could be something where they have an older system, you know, that's, that's, uh, well, I don't want to get into specifics in terms of the equipment type thing, but uh -huh. it was just older equipment. And so, you know, it was a 700 or 800 system. Maybe they added 1900 to it for, for 3G for the carriers, but then they want to add public safety, you know? And so I would think here, like in Colorado where I live, but what are your thoughts on being able to commingle systems? Is it good? Is it bad? Um, you know, are there are there certain areas where that would work right? I just want to get your your opinion because I think it's great as as a you know a consultant having been an integrator. It's like you know, like myself, you kind of see this from very different uh, viewpoints, and not just one kind of myopic, but just from very different viewpoints. So I was just curious, what are your thoughts on being able to do that? Well, I think there's there's um, there's no reason why you can't. But there are definitely specific applications where it's it's a, it'll be a good choice, and applications where it's not a good choice. So, for example, I'll go back to my my project in that's in California that I'm working on right now that has a VHF public safety system that's simplex. It's not going to work for a cellular, and in part it's because the components that I am providing the to, to get maximum bloom on the VHF, which is hard to do anyway in an attractive form factor. They're not going to support 1900 or 2100. Also, that, that the infrastructure that I need for those frequencies is sparse. I just need to put a few downlink antennas and then some uplink antennas, and it's sort of minimal, and it's just not, not going to work for a cellular enhancement solution. But there are applications where I think it's a good idea. And the, the best application I can think of are schools, K through eight or K through 12, kind of, or, you know, middle school or however they're doing that now. And I was going to school, it was junior high and high school, but they call yeah, it other too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that doing a commingled infrastructure is a, is a good utilization of that infrastructure as long as the, the cellular signal source is an FCC Part 20 sort of sort of solution, um, and by those people on the call that may not know what that is, but an FCC Part 20 doesn't require carrier approval. That equipment is pre-approved for off-air rebroadcast of carrier frequencies. You still have to go through the contract process and get a license to rebroadcast because the carrier owns those frequencies. But what you don't have to do is guarantee a very stringent key performance indication signal level like you would with a carrier grade uh, system like in a stadium or a very big project. And so I think based on utilization of wanting not just emergency responder communications, but also wanting the ability for your kids to call you 
um, for, you know, in the event of something awful like an active shooter or any kind of, um, you know, public safety event. Uh, I think that that's a good leverage of that infrastructure because it's not going to be a lot of, of antennas. It's not going to be a lot of components. Um, so, so you're not going to have this glorious signal level that a carrier would require, but you're basically just rebroadcasting what's on the outside of the building into the inside and guaranteeing that level of communication. I think it's a good application there. I don't think it's a good application for really large projects like high-rise buildings because, first of all, the, when a carrier provides coverage in a building, they're doing that because their user has a need, but their user also has an expectation of quality of that service. And an off-air rebroadcast solution in a dense urban environment in a high-rise building over a thin public safety antenna chain is not going to provide a good result. Basically, the signal outside can be very noisy because of multiple broadcast towers and all an FCC Part 20 off-air BDA is doing is rebroadcasting that noisy environment. So it's, it's like I said, it's got a limited application, but good application. I mean, I honestly think keeping communications, you know, communications in schools is really important. And I think that's a good application. Did I yeah. answer your question? No, 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 that was great. No, I completely agree. Um, yeah, I think you get kind of reach a threshold where, yeah, you can't just do part one, you know, and you can't uh -huh. commingle those because, yeah, just for the sake of, like you're talking about the KPIs of key performance indicators, um, you know, and have carrier grade to be able to solicit their participation for signal source that, yeah, it's going to have to be a lot more stringent than, um, yeah, if you were to put in a part 20 system. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you were to design for carrier grade, then you would have to be very very clever on how you dealt with what was actually public safety and what isn't, because anything that's public safety is going to require the hardening required by code, whereas cellular coverage is just those systems aren't governed by any codes. Yeah. You know, yeah, true. Any, you know. Yeah. I don't know if I ever saw any yeah, two-hour rated cable in a cellular install. No. Mm -mm. So in your opinion, what, what parts are, so let's just say you have a school uh, school where you feel it would be appropriate to install an off-air um, cellular dash, and it's required and and to have a, an ERCES or an ERCS installed. Where can you commingle these two systems? Where What infrastructure can they share reasonably uh, where both systems can still function independently and still and still work well? Well, what you can commingle is the passive antenna chains. You know, if you, if, you know, if I had, let's say I had a project that was, I don't know how big schools are, really maybe 100,000 square feet. I know from a ERC standpoint, it's going to be a BEA only. So, you know, I'm going to find my head end location, best location to get an antenna off the roof, put that in an equipment room, and then run my, my passive antenna chains out. You can easily diplex another frequency onto that same antenna chain, depending on, obviously, the frequencies you're supporting for public safety. But let's assume they're 7, 8, which is what a lot of jurisdictions are. Yeah, the, an antenna that's going to support the public safety frequencies, the couplers or splitters that you're using along your, your antenna chain are going to support those same cellular frequencies. Up to a certain point, you know, you're not going to see C band. I mean, maybe you will, but you probably won't re be rebroadcasting C band anyway. But you'd be getting PCS and cellular and uh, and AWS frequencies. And for those of you who don't know what those are, we're talking about eight fifty and nineteen hundred twenty one hundred. So yeah, so that would be pretty straightforward to do. Oh, that's pretty cool. I think that would be a, uh, and so for those, for those uh, jurisdictions who are kind of laying down the sledgehammer and saying, no, you can't commingle. I mean, I, it seems to me that they're kind of doing a detriment to, I mean, in every way, shape and form. In other words, because I have heard that and I have seen that where 
they will not permit them to commingle at all. Yeah, and, that's kind of. I think that the, the prohibiting of commingling has a lot to do with interference, and it's very much based on the macro environment and what's going on on the macro environment. So, and I don't think you would actually see an application where you want to potentially rebroadcast in a dense urban environment that already has a lot of RF noise and interference. But certainly there's always a risk that 850 cellular could interfere with 800 public safety. And so like if you have a really loud barking BDA doing 850 cellular pointed coincidentally in about the same direction as you're trying to get your public safety signal out, you could be showering that side with noise. So but I really see the application for schools being more in suburban and urban and, and rural environments where you'd have poor communication out there anyway, but you don't, because you don't have a dense macro environment. So high risers is like something definitely to stay away from. You, you just don't yeah, want to even consider co-mingling there. You're talking about too much interference, too much going on. Uh, so. Well, and also antenna, antenna density. Density, if you're yeah. high rise and do it right. You're going to design it for carrier grade. Mm -hmm. So that's just going to be, you know, four times the amount of infrastructure. So it would definitely be better to keep those separate. Uh, that's amazing. So what's your take on where uh, it sounds like we've had a lot of great pr progress in general. You know, I have learned doing uh, these DAS talks, I've, I've learned a little bit about other countries and kind of where they stand and, and there certainly isn't a lot of regulation in many other countries. And it, and it seems to me that there, there could be, at least on a limited level, to, to keep better communications inside buildings. I know our neighboring country, country, Canada, I just recently found out there's only in maybe British Columbia, I've heard that there's, there's some enforcement or regulation revolving around this. In other parts, there are not. It's just wide open. It's if you feel so, it's important. But it seems like the U.S. is is pretty kind of paving the way when it comes to, you know, enforcement and in in building communications. And from what I can see, it's it's a great thing. It's a really really important thing because we certainly have had our fair share of emergencies, and it, and it can be big, massive, terrible ones that you hear about in the news. But then there's the little ones too that really really matter. There's the ones where, you know, we have a child who's who's looks like they're having a seizure and now we need to call out of the building and then you know first responders get there and then they can't communicate in the building once they're there so they can't call out and they can't communicate in you know and, and that sounds like a, a small thing but it becomes a really important thing when it's your kid or it's your kid's friend or when you're the teacher and you're in that moment and you're feeling panicked because you just can't communicate with anybody you know, so I see it this way is the impact that we're doing. It sounds small. The navigation of the code seems to be critical. It's really, really important. And the fact that we can get it right, you know, truly can give people peace of mind and and a certain knowing that, you know, that at least my kids are a little bit safer in schools and or when I go into this building, it's going to be safer or, or whatever that may be. And so I think the contributions have been really good. What do you think about the future of the code and, and, and thoughts about where do you think it's going to be going next? I don't know. It's just a, a kind of a tough question. you think there are more mods that have to be done to get better or where can we improve on? Well, that's a, well, that's really, I think that's a really astute question um, because having followed, having uh, followed the migration of it, Mostly, you know, not because I'm like a, an observer with my field glasses on, but mostly because I've been hunting for the right information so I can do my job. You know, I would say that the, the, the 1225 has done the best job of clarifying a lot of things that were, you know, open-ended question marks for, for each, you know, previous cycle. So... What I would like to honestly see is a little bit better. And it, you know, I can honestly say I've reviewed it and I've actually done a comparison with the old um, 1221 just to see what the differences are. But I haven't actively lived in it yet because I don't have any projects that are under that doc, you know, that document's code cycle yet. 
But one of the things that I wanted to bring up was way back in the good old days, uh, testing of large buildings was called out in NFPA 5000, which is another document that's out there. And it provided a guideline for testing for coverage, you know, the grid testing that, you know, we all know about. It provided a guideline for testing very large floor plays. And I kind of feel like that needs to be a little bit, I, that needs to be tighter, more tightly written. Because right now it's 20 grids. And then if you don't pass, if two or more of your grids don't pass, then you do a 40 grid. And, but for really large floor plates and NFPA 5000 basically said greater than 123,000 square feet, there's what you want to do. Um, I feel like that's, that's not clear enough because you can have, I, I, if you think about it, 120,000 square feet is a lot and 20 grids. What, what do you, I mean, you can wander around with your spectrum analyzer until you find the right signal. So I'd like to see, I'd like to see that clarified a bit um, just for testing. And of course, the other piece to testing is that we're no longer looking at RSSI. We're looking at delivered audio quality. And I feel like that's a little subjective in terms of how you rank it. The minimum is 3.0, but it's, it's a qualitative criteria, how well you hear. So it's also tempered by how good your hearing is. I guess you got to make sure the person with the radio can hear, can hear well, right? <laughs> and maybe there's a certain, you know, some people can't hear well at certain tones too. So. Right. Well, exactly. And then there's another standard out, and forgive me for, bring, for bringing it up without being able to tell you what it is. But it requires using Harvard sentences for testing, as opposed to just, can you hear me? Click, yes, I can hear you. So I, it, it would be good to get the, the 1225 stitched in a little bit more with, I think it's a TSD 18 something. I'll get back to you after this with the exact standard, but it requires testing using Harvard sentences. So wait, what's a, what's a, what's a Harvard sentence? Well, I think I'm you curious. can Google what they are, but it's something like the the quick brown fox jump over the lazy sleeping dog. I think. Oh, is that what it is? I think that's a Harvard sentence, and there's a list of like 20 Harvard sentences that you can use for testing. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. Well, that's kind of cool, and it would actually make the discussion kind of fun if we're blurting off. Harvard sentences versus just can you hear me now? I mean, well, yeah. Well, and that's a, another kind of a regional difference. It's like, you know, I've been, before I joined in Trauma, which is how they work for now, um, I did most of my work on the West Coast, fo focusing primarily in Northern California because there's a lot of work and development there. But it, as I've um, worked here, which is two and a half years, we do a lot of bi coastal work, a lot of stuff on the East Coast. And it was actually working with my East Coast coworkers team where I found out about Harvard census. And of course, you know, had my little internal conversation with myself of leap. I didn't know about that, you know, <laughs> but yes, it's in one of the technical standards. And so I feel like that needs to be stitched into testing criteria so that it's, you know, everybody's doing the same thing, you know. So you do realize when everyone watches this episode, what they are going to be doing is Googling Harvard what's sentences. Harvard sentences. Like right well, away, there's going to be hundreds and even maybe maybe tens of hundreds of people Googling Harvard sentences and, and figuring out what they are and what we've got to use in our jurisdiction. And when we do our uh, our DAQ testing, I think that's going to I think that's going to be a fun fun thing to do. Now we can all talk in Harvard sentences. Mm -hmm. Well, awesome. I think we've covered a lot of great topics today, and it's been a fantastic discussion. I've I've thoroughly enjoyed having you on, Hollis. You've been uh, just fantastic and, and very, very knowledgeable when it comes to code. I, I love the ideas that you brought up, you know, about NFPA uh, 1225 and about where we can improve. You never want to stop improving. 
You always want to make things better. You want to strive to make things better, of course. And I like your take on the code where we've gotten a little bit more efficient, where we've actually gotten done a better job and not been too overzealous on the code. And it's gotten smarter. Smarter code is always better. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's a benefit to the integrator. It's a benefit to the, the building owner. It's a, it's a benefit to the people and all the stakeholders who are using the system, including, you know, public safety, including the residents um, who then can, can get heard when they're when their first responders show up and, and so on. So I think it's been fantastic. The, the last thing that I wanted to point out when we talk about code is that, and I mentioned this in my bio information, is that ASME 17.1, which is, which is the elevator code, I was on the technical committee that got the code changed to, I was actually their technical advisor on, on radio systems. Like we got the code written so that you can now put infrastructure to support first responder coverage in elevator shafts. Now, it's written very specifically around leaky cable. I think that was what was felt was the most minimally invasive kind of thing. But up until that, that recent addition, nothing was allowed in elevator shafts and coverage is required in elevator cars, especially fire service access elevators. So just wanted to just get that out there for people that don't know that. No, that's great well, to know, Hollis. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, again, so thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being on uh, today's episode. I found it thoroughly uplifting, and I'm sure our listeners, too. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Desktop by Gamma, keeping you connected and protected.